Chapter 18 Hawk made a point of avoiding people from his old hood. The accusatory glares weren't easily warded off just because he wasn't ashamed of his job. But this morning, while watching prisoners being let off of arriving buses, he saw Dennis Cox. His stomach pinwheeled as he watched the feeble figure, head bowed, shuffle beleaguerly into the intake building. When Hawk saw the skeletal frame disappear behind the mechanical doors, visions of Dante's divine comedy popped into his head. He raced to the building. Once inside the cavernous field house, he sifted through the sea of despondency looking for his friend. He couldn't single him out. Everybody looked the same. Ghosts. Finally, he spotted him, sitting on a bench slouched over, frail and withdrawn. Dennis seemed more child than man. When Hawk tapped Dennis's shoulder, he felt bone beneath the threadbare stained shirt. Almost catatonic, Dennis didn't notice Hawk at all. Hey, man. How you doing? Huh? Hey, man. What'd they get you for? They didn't get me, Den. I'm here to help you. Dennis stared past Hawk for a moment before turning absently away. Suddenly, a voice called out. I've been searching everywhere for you. He turned to see a perturbed Dela Cruz hastily making her way toward him. The instant Dennis saw Dela Cruz, he stood up. Struggling to gather enough air to gain his voice, he gasped. Dell, I knew you'd come back. Looking as if he'd just seen the risen Christ, he implored Dela Cruz. Let's go home, baby. Let's go home. She looked at Hawk. He thinks you're his wife. She's Mexican. You know this guy? No. Not this guy. Dennis stretched toward Dela Cruz. I thought you didn't want me no more, babe. Hawk stepped between them. No, Den. This isn't Sylvia. This is Adelina. She works for me. Dela Cruz took a step back. It was the first time she'd heard Jesse speak her given name. The sound of it, formed with his own breath, was unlike she'd ever heard it. Her face burned. Dennis didn't hear any of it. Reaching again for Dela Cruz, he repeated, I knew you'd come back. Hawk held him back. The body he restrained felt more like broken pretzels and saran wrap than flesh and bone. Suddenly, the fact that he'd helped enforce policies that had cost his friend his family, his freedom, and maybe his mind, hit home. Alarmed by Dennis's condition and compelled as much by guilt as compassion, Hawk called for assistance. Orderlies appeared and led Dennis away, leaving Dela Cruz to gently offer her sympathies. Unaccepting of condolences, Hawk walked away. But before disappearing, he called over his shoulder. Give me the prognosis ASAP. He barely heard her as she shouted, Your special assistant is waiting for you back in the office. He'd hardly gotten through the door before he heard the hearty greeting. Wesley Painter, reporting for duty, sir. He grasped Wesley's eager hand and gave it a firm shake, whereupon Wesley fairly gushed. I can't believe you remembered me, sir. I'll never be able to properly thank you. Hawk pushed Dennis from his mind and summoned his commander persona. Glad to have you aboard, Wesley. Considering what was at stake, Hawk hoped he'd pick the right man for the job. Any trouble finding me? A sheepish grin played across Wesley's face. <laughs> Not at all, sir. Seems like everybody around here knows pretty much everything about you. Expelling a self-deprecating chuckle, Hawk admitted to being kind of a freak show. Looking the new guy over, he quickly assessed Wesley's sense of style. His navy blue suit and well-worn black shoes were presentable enough, but not quite up to Hawk's standards. Pointing to the hardware chair by his desk, Hawk cordially invited Wesley to sit. Wesley's commitment was evident in his posture as he sat ramrod straight on the chair's edge. This was the attitude Hawk had hoped for. You excited? Yes, sir. I sure am, sir. You ever been to Homestead, Florida? As Hawk briefed Wesley on what to expect and what was expected of him, De La Cruz returned. Before he could ask about Dennis, she flatly announced. He doesn't know where he is, sir. He's in and out of lucidity. Doctor needs to run more tests. Says she'll know more in a day or two. Hawk thanked her before introducing Wesley. Still chafing over being considered less trustworthy than the stranger, Dela Cruz offered only a courtesy smile. If Wesley took it as a slight, he didn't show it. Miss Dela Cruz, please see to it that Mr. Painter patronizes a proper haberdashery. Expense it. He turned to Wesley. We have appearances to maintain. No offense. Wesley assured him none was taken. Dela Cruz was done with the best foot forward stuff. Wesley annoyed her. She knew she was being irrational, and that annoyed her even more. If her boss didn't trust her, so what? 
What did she care? But she did. I noticed the place. She said, even though she had no idea what a shop. When would you like me to take him? Today is good. This afternoon, then. She said and slipped through the door before anyone could respond. Hawk was having trouble figuring out the current situation's end game. All the scenarios looked bad. Not only was he out of the inside loop, but troops were on the verge of invading the old neighborhood. If institutional compliance problems weren't complicated enough, a hot war with Islam could always heat things up. What the fuck? Seemed the only appropriate response. You get Wesley squared away? He asked when Dela Cruz walked in. She assumed her customary lean against the door jam as a wistful melancholy shrouded her face. He called me Sylvie. Wasn't that the name on the list you gave me? Sylvia Cox? Jessie was surprised she remembered Sylvia's last name. Yeah. Kids still missing? Jessie didn't look up, only nodding in reply. She could see the question rubbed hard. You're not blaming yourself. Of course not. It's not your fault. You did everything you could. Did I? Hulk could feel her eyes on him, and he straightened his shoulders. You're a good man, Jesse. Nobody could ask for a better friend. She was trying to help him off the hook, but he wasn't ready to be forgiven. You don't know me. I think I do. It was an unadorned statement, a simple opinion, yet the simplicity of its conviction served as a much-needed healing balm to his wounded spirit. Since the first time he'd seen her, Hawk thought of Dela Cruz as one of the most beautiful women ever. But at this moment, it was like he was seeing her for the very first time. More than outward good looks, she epitomized the cliche of being beautiful on the inside. She was simply that which Willis was talking about. You okay? <clears throat> yeah, just worried about my boy. She mercifully played along. Doctor says you can see him tomorrow. In that moment, everything changed. Nobody knows how these things happen. The personal paradigm having unalterably shifted left nothing more to be said. Accordingly, intuition nudged Dela Cruz from the room. The next day, after dispatching a dapper Wesley to Homestead, Hawk went to the infirmary. He arrived to find Dennis struggling to prop himself up in bed. The movie, Malcolm X, was playing on a TV suspended on a stand in the corner. You've been hoodwinked, bamboozled, led astray. Dennis was quoting in tandem with the film's dialogue when Hawk came in. Dennis turned to him. I never understood that run muck line. He clicked off the TV. You been hoodwinked, I get. Bamboozled, I get. Led astray. But ain't nobody run muck. Hawk hadn't expected to find Dennis awake, let alone lucid. Damn, look at you. Living the life, taking in the flicks. How you feeling? Don't mind me. I'm just another nigga saying what everybody already know. Although Hawk was encouraged by the strength in his friend's voice, he wasn't sure he liked what he was hearing. What's that then? We just like the Jews. Old Testament 1930s both. Been 400 years and Pharaoh still won't let my people go. You better listen to me. You listen? What you saying, bruh? You remember that time we went out to Bakersfield to your mama's sister place and she had all them animals? Yeah. When you put the baby goats in the pig pen because you want to see them play with the pigs. Yeah. But they kept fighting until you finally had to separate them. Why are you bringing this up? Pigs ain't want them goats in their pen. Yeah, I remember. So? So you a goat in a pig pen. You've been hoodwinked, bamboozled. And it ain't long before the trains come. Maybe it's the meds talking Hawk thought as he leaned on the railing at the foot of the bed and tried to assess his friend's condition. Trains? Oh, trains coming. Listen to me. You listening? Yeah, I am. Dennis leaned forward. I ain't never told you this before. I ain't never told nobody this before, and I ain't looking for no feedback, neither. Hawk got the odd feeling Dennis might say something important. Last night I had a dream. I don't have these kind of dreams often, but when I do, when I do, they happen. Dennis studied Hawk's expression to make sure he was being taken seriously. I seen trains in the dream. When the trains come, that means it's about to jump off. As crazy as it sounded, Hawk wondered if he was listening to more than med-induced ramblings. Black people have a penchant for giving credence to dreams and divinations. Still, that didn't mean he wasn't skeptical. What does that even mean? I don't know what it means. But in the dream, the trains left full but came back empty. Left where? Here, yeah, motherfucker. Then Dennis asked a strange question. Why you was never captain of your team? What? At that sea, why you was never team captain? Why are you asking me that? Just answer the question, why you was never captain of the team? I don't know. They tried to make me captain a few times, but I didn't want it. 
Why? I tell you why. Because you ain't want the responsibility, that's why. You ain't want to carry the weight of always having to win, always got to be better. You knew whether the team win or lose, you yourself personally is going to be all right. You'll be a star no matter what happens. But you don't want nobody looking at you like you the leader. You ain't want to carry everybody else's weight. You took the Marine promotions because they come with the territory. You couldn't turn them down, but you ain't really want them. They come with the expectation. You just want to do your thing, get out with a pension. Now, you're on Easter Street. You're a coward, Jesse. You scared to be a real leader. Bullshit. I let fight a squadron. Oh, it's bullshit, all right. You think you better know all that skydiving and shit just to prove something to yourself? Nigga, I ain't got nothing to prove to nobody. Hawk looked around to make sure he hadn't been overheard. What do you want from me? What do you want from yourself? Unwilling to be forced down this path, Hawk changed the subject. You didn't ask me about your people. Dennis instantly shut down. I know about my people. You found them? I ain't say that. What then? They've been sold. The fuck you talking about? You ain't find them, did you? No, but that don't mean. Three months ago, she called in the middle of the night. I could hear them beating. Girls screaming in the background. Who? They wanted money to let them go. Who was beating them? Keepers sold them to smugglers. What smugglers? Smugglers, nigga, I don't know. Well, how do you know they were smugglers? She told me. Where is she? She say Azerbaijan. What? They worked in mining camps in Kazakhstan. She's working the mines? She's working the camps. Hawk suddenly realized Dennis's family had been sold into sex slavery. They wanted me to hear her get beaten. I sold my house. You gave them the money? Yeah. How much? All of it. How'd you get it to them? Put it in the bank. Silver gave them the account number. I ain't heard nothing since. Why didn't you call me? I did. Voicemail. Hawk felt his nuts contract and instantly recalled Danny's admonition. Dennis sensed Hawk's impotence. Ain't nothing you can say. It's past all that. No, I'll get Kellogg to out. No, fuck that. They did by now. If the Russians ain't kill him, Sylvie did. She ain't let no shit like that go down. Hawk went numb, but Dennis wasn't through. I asked you why you didn't want to be captain of that team. You still ain't said nothing. Okay. You want to know? I'll tell you. He'd never shared the reasons for a lot of the decisions he'd made. He wasn't particularly proud of some of them, but he'd been guided by the principles that had been part of his life since he could remember. All right. During the Korean War... The what? The, nigga, you want to hear the story of what? I don't know. Do I? Hulk pulled a chair next to the bed and sat down. My granddaddy was a paratrooper assigned to the 2nd Ranger Infantry Company Airborne, a segregated unit. Everybody, including officers, was black. So in December 1950, he deployed to South Korea. That's when the company adopted the nom de guerre, Buffalo Rangers. Come on, man. They're war name. They served as a scouting unit for the 7th Infantry Division. And you know what that meant. They were dropped at the front and were always the first to run up on the Red Chinese. This was some close proximity shit. There was no pride in his temper when he added, Granddaddy was a hero. At least that's what the Army said back in 51. Black newspapers told it like this. Hawk leaned forward and recited the old printed account from memory. In early February 1951, First Sergeant Stanley James Hawkins' platoon was attacking a hill just northeast of Seoul. During the firefight, they got pinned down and the unit's leader got killed. Granddaddy took command. He rallied the men and despite all the odds, convinced them to carry the charge up the hill. With machine gun and grenades, Granddaddy destroyed three hostile positions and killed seven enemy soldiers before the unit got pinned down again. Granddaddy did what he could to push the men forward, but this time it was a no-go. Eventually, heavy grenade fire drove them back. He was struggling to hold his position when the enemy grenade exploded right in front of him. Shrapnel ripped him to his chest, but he brushed the medic off, led another charge up the hill. This time, they reached the top. When he saw the bunker that was firing the mortars, Granddaddy ran ahead of the platoon, shredding the bunker with machine gun fire. The defenders took off, and Granddaddy took out another machine gun. That's when the next grenade hit. First Sergeant Stanley James Hawkins might have been a hero to the army, but granddaddy wasn't no hero to my grandmama. When she got the news that he was dead, all she said was, he'd be alive today if he just had kept his head down and followed orders. Hawk got quiet and looked at Dennis as if to say, you understand now? Dennis flopped back on the bed and rolled his eyes to the ceiling. That's a good story, nigga, but what they got to do with you? Everything. Mama had a hard life because of that. She needed a father. 
Her mama needed a husband. Ain't that a bitch? How many niggas you know ain't had a hard life? Why's that go, nigga? You ain't had no daddy and you turned out all right. The mention of his father triggered uneasy feelings. Neither Dennis nor Hawk knew their fathers. It was a subject they hadn't talked about since they were kids. As boys, they'd ignored their mother's bad daddy rants and made a game of telling stories about the day daddy came home. The tales were more like exaggerated Christmas wishes than fables. They'd spin yarns about whose daddy would have the finest car, most expensive house, best clothes, and so on. My daddy gonna have this, one would say. Well, my daddy gonna be that, the other would reply, always trying to top the other. But by the time they got to middle school, the stories had stopped. And this was the first time the subject had come up in years. If Dennis was willing to go there, Hawk knew two things. One, Dennis's mind was razor sharp. And two, he was serious as fuck. What's your point? Last night I had another dream. All right, Dr. King, what did you see? You might got jokes, but this shit ain't funny. I'm sorry, okay. What did you see? I saw you. In the dream, there was a whole bunch of people standing down in a big old valley. It was dark all around, and you were standing on top of this mountain. You was holding up some kind of torch that made a bright, bright light. It was so bright, it lit up everything around you. But down below where the people was, it was dark as hell. They was all looking up to the light and reaching out, holding out their hand. To who? To you, nigga. Ain't you listening? Hey, you, you're going to have to give me this, but listen, man. But nothing. That's when the trains come and went all day, all night. You can't run from this. What run? Nigga, you Black Moses. I ain't no goddamn Black Moses, goddammit. You ain't got me to convince. I'm just telling you what the dreams say. And I don't care what the dream says. I ain't nobody's Black Moses. Well, who are you then? Because the way I see it, you either Moses or Judas. Listen to me. You listening? No, you better be. Because he was out here straight cutting motherfuckers' tongue out. Squeeze a motherfucker throat, stick a blade in his mouth, twist and pull out a tongue. I seen that shit with my own eyes. What a nigga supposed to do with shit like that? Hawk heard himself repeating words he'd heard his mother say a million times. Even as he spoke, he considered the irony of a man in his position relating the wisdom of his mother. But she'd had a fine-tuned instinct for survival. Her wisdom was the reason he was where he was today. And the words she repeated now had always proven true. We're going to get through this. I don't know how right now, but we will. Dennis managed to smile. I might have questioned your judgment from time to time, but never your word. Hawk stood up. Thanks. I appreciate that. But you're wrong about the Jew thing. Dennis looked puzzled. Blacks aren't the Jews from the 30s or the 40s or the Bible. We have never been the Jews. We are Pharaoh. We've always been Pharaoh. Nick Carlson was pissed. He'd come to the bungalow red-faced and huffing over the absence of workers. How are they going to work if they don't eat? He acted like he didn't know that was the whole point. They weren't going to work, eat, or anything else until they got what they wanted. The problem was, Hawk didn't know what they wanted. He knew there was a major power play in the way, but he didn't know what the upshot was. Understanding what who wanted and why was the challenge. He exhaled deeply when he got the word. T. Edmund Longstreet and the Moore Scientific Temple had convinced the West Adams crowds to disperse. The notion that Longstreet had been personally involved with convincing people to return to their homes gave Hawk pause. Everything had happened quickly and without violence. Utilities had even been restored. While Hawk was glad the guard wouldn't be called in, he wondered how Longstreet had pulled it off. He rerouted Wesley to the California Military Academy at San Luis Obispo. It was just a matter of time before the administration found some other pretext for sending the guard into South Central. Hawk needed to be ready. Wesley's job was to recon the academy. Prior to leaving for Homestead, Wesley had wanted to know why Hawk had picked him for his right-hand man. You're trusting me with some heavy responsibility, sir. You're afraid you can't handle it? No, sir, I know I can, but the fact is that then I... Then why question my judgment? It's just that you don't know me. You don't know anything about me. I know you enlisted in the Navy right out of Pacifica High, where you graduated with a B average. You served four years as a seaman, and you got an honorable discharge. You started working at Long Park a year before we met. You married Juanita Fields, your high school sweetheart. You have two brothers, one older, one younger. Your older brother Cecil is a preacher, Baptist, Kansas City. Your baby brother Bruce is doing six years, Pollock, Louisiana, drugs. Your mother, Mamie, diabetic, lives with you and the wife. No kids. 
But to answer your question, I picked you precisely because we have no history. I never get close to my wingmen. I trust them, but I don't form personal relationships with them. Things happen. I'm not trying to be your friend. Wesley was disappointed by the revelation he wasn't considered to be a friend, but he didn't show it. Yes, sir, he said, feigning agreement, before quickly adding, Sir, I'm not going to die, am I? 